Isn't alive in you this morning? We're in trouble, Jack. <laughs> Jack, we got to go home and pray again. Get things ready. Jesus has to be. But you know what I want to talk to you about this morning? Jesus. Power. Wow. Power. 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 There's, there's songs, power in the blood. Yeah. That's right. Power, power, wonder working power. The power of Jesus is stronger than anything you could have in your life. But people aren't always thinking about that kind of power. You always hear people are on a power trip. You know, they're, they're wanting to be the king hobnob, so to speak. I guess I have, whatever that word is they use. You see people going to gyms to lift weights and get muscles so they can be powerful. You see people that seek power of position. They want to be president of the United States because they're the most powerful person in the free world. Hogwash. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> Jesus is the most powerful person in the free world. Amen. No person is more powerful than Jesus. And, you know, you get people out there all the time that are seeking power and, and position and fame because they think that they're going to be better than everybody else. Right. Hogwash. <laughs> Nobody's more powerful than my Jesus. Right. How do I know that? Because he overcame death, hell, and the grave. And because of that, he has redeemed you by his own personal blood. You tell me what man in this world today could release you from your sins with his blood. No one. No one. But I want to talk to you. This, oh, guess you better get your Bibles out if you want to follow along with me. <laughs> Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 19. We started to go there last week. But then God changed things and now we're back to things. 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 19. So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Seraphat who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he with the 12. And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again. For what have I done to thee? And he returned back from him and took the yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave them to the people and they did eat. He then arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. Father, I thank you this morning for your word. I pray, God, this morning, may your word become alive. Maybe, maybe it become active, Father God, within our hearts this morning. Speak to us, Lord Jesus, this morning. Let us be obedient to your word. In Jesus' name. Elijah, a mighty prophet of God, near the close of his ministry. He challenged wicked King Ahab. He prayed with such power, he stopped rain for six months. That's a powerful prayer. 
How much power do you have in your prayer life? When you pray, are you earnestly praying with the authority of Jesus Christ behind you? Or are your words just going amiss? He became the second man in space after Enoch. He was so important that Moses and Jesus, he met, I should say, met Moses and Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration. You see, Elijah was commissioned to choose Elisha as his successor. You know, when I began to think about this story, and as I read it again, and I thought it, and I was molded over, and, and I was looking back at some notes from several years, I was like, that wasn't deep enough. We didn't go far enough with that. Because there's so much wrapped up in those few verses. Think about that for a moment. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen when Elijah showed up. He was evidently successful and loved doing the things in a big way because he's in a field with all the hired hands working beside them, plowing the field, making a big... He, he was close to his people. You see, one thing I have found about the servant of God, somebody who loves Jesus Christ with his whole heart, will work close to those who don't know him so that they can see Jesus in him. You see, the field, the people working in the field, they, they just didn't know him. They worked with him. They knew his character. They knew, they knew his person. And now his life was fixing to be turned around and it would never be the same. How many can I say this morning, when we came to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, how many can say he actually turned our life around and it's never been the same since? Amen. If you can say, well, some things are still the same, then was there a true change? Good question. Yeah. You see, I think when Jesus comes into our heart and our life, he radically changes us. I'm not saying radically go out there and bomb somebody so you can say, I did. Oh, Jesus told me to go out there and bomb that car. I don't go for that business. But I'm saying, you know, we're, we're being told today in the news that we're radical Christians. Hallelujah, I'm a radical Christian because of Jesus Christ. I am radical. That's right. And I'm going to take a stand for him, and I'm going to preach about him. I'm going to talk about him, and I'm going to share him wherever I go. And if that makes me a radicalist, then that's what I am. Because I have a radical father. The Lord knew Elisha before Elijah ever arrived. Matter of fact, 1 Peter 1 and chapter 1, verse 2 says, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, therefore, or through sanctification of the Spirit, unto the obedience of the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace. Be multiplied. You see, Peter encouraged his readers by strong declaration that we were chosen. You are the elect of God. That means you have been chosen by God. See, a lot of times when we think about the chosen of God, we, we, we think of just those in Israel, the chosen, his chosen people. But you know what? Through the blood of the cross of Jesus Christ, you have now been chosen because you have said, Jesus, I give you my heart and my life. I give you everything that is within me. I give over to you. 
That means you have fully surrendered. Amen. I'm not talking about throwing up the white flag to the enemy. I'm saying that he has helped you destroy the enemy that once lived in your life. Amen. Amen. Why? Because you surrendered to him. You see, a lot of times we don't want to surrender things. There's some things in our life we just don't want to get rid of. Well, it's not really going to hurt anything. It's really not going to hurt anybody. It's okay. As long as I don't hurt anybody. But have you ever thought about how it grieves the Holy Spirit? See, a lot of us think of me. The most powerful person in me is me. But see, Jesus lives in us. And the most powerful person in you is him. And so when you fail to yield to his will, you're telling him no. How many of us as small children would tell our fathers no? How many would tell your mother no? You know, that's one of the first words children learn, pretty much. No. Foul word. No. People always get on to me and say, you never say no. And it's pretty much true. I, I don't usually say no. That's my, one of my downfalls. There are times I should be saying no. No is not necessarily a bad word when it's used in the right context. No only becomes bad when you tell Jesus no. Or you tell your mom and dad no. I remember as a kid telling my mom no once. I said the word once. I didn't use it again. I learned quickly. How many know what a flyswatter water is? Remember those flies water, the plastic, they got those little rivet things? Woo! They hurt. How about Dad's fist? And I'm not talking about uh, on the behind. I mean, it was like whoosh, Only because she was higher up than me. And, the, and my babon was lower than the flyswatter, water. So it just... It just happened to catch my lips. I learned that day that, you know, that was disgusting. She killed flies with that thing and she hit me in the mouth. I went and washed my mouth out and I got the tooth. I must have brushed my teeth three or four times. Because I'm thinking I got fly guts in there or something. Terrible. But I didn't use that word again. Why? Because I learned. I learned that there, there are people that God has placed in authority over us that we just can't say no to. Now, I have said no to people in authority over me. I've said it as recently as COVID. When they said no church, no, Jesus says church. Well, you can't get together. Jesus says get together. See, that's when no to me didn't follow. Because I have to say yes to the word of God and no to man. Because the word of God is more powerful than the most powerful man on earth. The Bible is more powerful than the president of the United States. More powerful than any leader in any other country. Because this is the living word of God. They don't have a living word. They, they not breathe life into me like Jesus has. The Lord called Elijah... Elijah, before Elijah even announced it, according to 
as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that ye should be what? Holy and without blame before him in love. You see, Paul said, God hath chosen us to emphasize that salvation depends totally on God. You can't save yourself. People want to save their self. Uh, we've got it. Uh, this is a great one. We've got to have one of those interventions. We've got to get in there. We've got to save them from themselves. You aren't doing anything. You aren't doing anything. You see, we can't save somebody. Jesus has to save them. Interventions work, yes, to an extent. But, the, but, the, but the, the extension of that program should be leading them to the cross. Jesus will keep them from self-destruction. We are not saved because we deserve it. It's because God is graciously and freely gives it. And so many times we don't think along those lines. The Lord used Elisha to tell Elijah or Elijah to tell Elisha of his call. God uses people to tell you about your call. God uses his servants to fulfill his will. He will use others filled with the Holy Spirit to confirm what he wants you to do. The mouth of two or three witnesses, his word is established. Amen? The Lord called Elisha to serve when he was busy. Remember, he was plowing a field. He was plowing a field. I can imagine this 12 year old officer, he's down there in this dirt, just, just really getting into it. I mean, probably busting a big sweat, just getting along, and all of a sudden this man comes along and throws his mantle on him. What is that? A mantle or a cloak was the most important article of clothing a person could own. It was used for protection against the weather. It was his bedding. It was a place uh, to sit. It was his luggage, so to speak. The mantle was very important. And he takes it and he just throws it on this guy who's plowing a field. Was that by mistake? No. God had already told him what to do. And he was following the will of God. The Lord called him to serve. God often demands that we leave worldly success behind to serve him. Amen. Yes. I remember when I was a veggie picker. Worked in the produce business. And, and, I, and I would look at produce, and I would decide whether it was good or bad. It went either in the big drum for the hogs or it went back in the box to be shipped to a store. And I remember when I, when I did that, and I, and I remembered I liked doing that. Back in 1986, I was, and this is a long time ago. Some of you might remember back that far. My wife loved me to death. I was making upwards of seven fifty plus a week. And in 1986, that was good money. My wife was a registered medical assistant. She worked in a, in a, in a what do you call that chair? In one of those walk-in clinics. And she liked her job. But she took me to church. It's her fault. No. She got me involved in a ministry there that I didn't want to get involved in. And it took off, and I loved it. And then God calls me to ministry. So I'm so happy and excited that God has called me. I go home and share it with her. She said, uh-uh. I said, like, what? Excuse me? Uh-uh. She said, I told you I didn't want to marry a preacher. I said, well, I wasn't one when we got married. 
Be careful what you ask God for. He didn't give it to you when you got married, but after you got married, he gave it to you. And I hemmed and hawed and was like, well, I really don't have enough time. I want to do it, but I don't have enough time. I, don't want, I want to do this, but I don't have enough time. It's amazing how God can make you have enough time. Little car accident, just turned the world upside down for him. Some people would look at it as a bad thing. But see, see, God did it for a good thing. But Elisha's conflict was God's call. You see, the call of God always creates conflict in our lives. God's call demands a decision to follow him. Church, we must surrender and we must be willing to put God and his word and his will before our own. You see, God's callings don't stop. I spoke to a young man who was going to resign his church or a church that he was at. And he said that God is calling him to move on. I thought that's, God does that, you know, God moves us. And I was listening intently and I thought it was a great thing. But then somebody came to him and said, we're going to leave. And they said, oh, well, if you're going to leave, we'll stay. And I thought, excuse me? But if God was moving you, why did you stay? You see, I find at times people can manipulate us into ungodly territory, if you will. Because we think we're going in the right direction. We know that God has called us to do something, but then people will manipulate us to stay behind. So then you're stuck with the quandary, should I have left or was I supposed to stay? Which brings me to Elisha. Elisha was a man who prayed with great power. You see, when we're seeking God's will, we need to be praying with great power. We need to be praying for God to totally reveal what we're supposed to do. And if God says go, don't stay. Because I'm going to tell you this, if you stay, it's not going to be good. It's not going to be pretty. It's like an auto mechanic. An auto mechanic sees you got a problem with your transmission, the proper thing to do is to unscrew the little bolts and whatever, how they disconnect it, and, and they fix it and they put it back together. But if you get so, the wrong auto mechanic, he might put some, what are they, they used to do this years and years ago, sawdust down in the transmission, let it run smooth for a little while longer. You sell it. And then you're like, I know about then you're like, I chose the wrong mechanic. No, you chose not to follow God. Sometimes we get stuck with that sawdust down in us. We, we try to do things to make us feel at ease with what we want to do with God. Instead of allowing God to totally use that oil that he's given us, his blood, his will in our hearts and our lives to change us to do that what he has called us to do. So we go like this. We don't want to hear any evil. We don't want to see any evil. And we don't want to do any evil. But we're the three monkeys opposite. I don't want to see his will. I don't want to do his will. And I don't want to follow his way. Because I have other things I want to do. 
People will bring conflict in your life. Moses had to leave his sheep. Peter had to leave his boat and his fish. For what purpose? To follow God. You have to give up some things that you may not be happy with giving up with, but you have to give it up and move forward. Elisha's many problems as he considered the call of God, one was his parents. What did he say? He wanted to go back and see his parents. He wanted to give them a kiss. He wanted to say, listen, i got to follow God. I want to give you a kiss. I'll see you later, that kind of stuff. Or I may never see you again. Whatever it was, he, he wanted to go back. Loved ones are often involved in our decision on following God. Sometimes we have to tune things out. The problem of his position was the farm. He was tending the farm. He was tending this huge field with many hired hands. And he loved what he did. I loved vegetables. I loved saying whether they were good or bad. I loved inspecting them and all that kind of stuff. But I loved the ministry more. But you see, God calls. God calls, and sometimes it's a battle. It's a battle. Think of the rich young ruler. God, he went to the Lord, and he wanted to follow the Lord. He said, what must I do? And what did he say? I want you to go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor. Come and follow me. The battle was money. The poor boy didn't understand that following God was going to be far greater than any wealth he could ever have. He couldn't give up the money. People in the world don't want to give up the money. You tell people, I want you to give more to missions. Don't tell me what to do with my money. I think you should give more to benevolence. Don't tell me what to do with my money. You see, what you have doesn't belong to you. What I have does not belong to me. It belongs to God. But God says, just let me prove. Just pay your 10% and see if I don't open up the windows of heaven and pour out my blessings. More than you can handle, more than you can take in. So people start giving, expecting just that. God knows the motives of our heart in what we do. Will you choose worldly things and lose God's best for your life? It's a question that only you can answer. See, Elisha decided that God would be first in his life. This is what caused him to get through his conflict? He chose God over everything else. God's call was more important than position and power. It was more important than anything that he was doing on the earth. He saw that God had to be taken in wholeheartedly, and he had to, he had to get out there and do what God called him to do. We have to get out there and do what God tells us to do, but we keep saying we don't have enough time. Let me pay somebody else to do it. Let me talk someone else into doing it. You see, God ultimately will become the most powerful man in your life when you surrender your whole life to him. So many people don't want to surrender to God because they're afraid of giving up something. Elisha made a public statement. What was his public statement? How did, how did he make it public? Well, he took the yokes off of those oxen 
and he made a huge bonfire and then he took the oxen and he barbecued them and had invited everybody to the feast. Woo, now that's a, that's a going away party. That's going out, man, big style. Big old barbecue out in the middle of the field for all the workers. You see, the neighborhood knew who he was. And they knew by him doing what he did, he was making a statement. You see, that's why we make a public profession of our faith when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ. We want people to know that we have a new ruler in our life, and it's Jesus Christ. And so we want people to know that we're Christians. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Maybe you don't want people to know you're a Christian. Maybe that's why it's so silent all the time when we talk about Christ in public. You know, I've always been told there are two places you don't talk about politics, work and church. Mm -hmm. There are two places that I talk about Jesus, work and church. In a couple weeks, I want to share something with you if it comes into fruition. And I'm excited about it. Amen. Oh, I'm really excited. It's all about work. They're hiring somebody, and I can't wait. Because I love Jesus. But let me ask you a question this morning. How are you responding to God's call in your life? How are you responding to God's call in your life? Do you count all things as loss for Christ? Will you public declare, publicly declare your surrender to him? When people say, do you know Christ? Do you say, yes, I do, and I love him? I give out our pens all the time. One guy came in Saturday, and he said, oh, it's a nice pen if you just didn't have to put the, that, you know, Jesus loves you on there. I said, but he does love you. That's why it's on us to remind you that he looks. Yeah, but that's, you know, people don't need to be reminded of that stuff. I said, oh, yes, they do. Yes. I said, and our church loves people. And our church wants people to know that Jesus loves them. Amen. Just as much as he loves them in the house. He's like, well, can't, couldn't you just put your church in there? I said, well, it's on there too. Yeah, but you got, it's, it's smaller print than the Jesus loves you. I said, because that's more important than the church. Oh, Jesus is more important than your church? Absolutely. I don't have a problem with letting people know stuff like that. And you know what? You shouldn't have a problem with telling people stuff like that. They need to know how much you love Jesus. Oh, boy. Sorry, Dr. Donnelly, we're going to have to start over. People need to know how much you love Jesus. You see, because he gave his life for you. He purchased you with his own blood, with the power of God behind him. Not E.F. Hutton, not Charles Stanley, whatever that firm is. Schwab. There you go, Charles Schwab. But God the Father, behind the Son, you can't ask for more power than that. You can't ask for more security than that. P. 
People worry about wealth. I don't worry about wealth. Why? Because my father owns a cattle on a thousand hills. <laughs> and because of that, I know he's going to watch out for me. He says he will provide for you. That what you have need of. Sometimes we worry about that. Uh, this young man who was called by God didn't worry about that, did he? He didn't say, oh, well, I've got it. Wait a minute. I need some time. I've got to sell off the land. I've got to sell off the oxen. I've got to sell off my slaves. i got to sell. So I make sure I have enough money to sustain myself in the ministry. No. The mantle was passed and off he went. Was mom and dad happy about it? I don't know. It doesn't say. But I'm sure they were. Because I don't know how anybody could be unhappy with you following the will of God. Amen. And if they're unhappy about you following the will of God, then they probably shouldn't be in your life. Or maybe you haven't done your part in getting them to Christ. You can look at that two ways. The glass is half full. Or half empty. Church, I just know this. When I thought about this story, when I've read this story again, all I can think about is the power of the passion that this man had for God. That he would know what he had to do once that mantle was put on him. What would you do if the mantle was put on you? Father, I thank you today for your word. Lord, you've given us a lot to ingest this morning. You've given us a lot to think about this morning. Lord, I pray most of all, Father, may your will be very clear and be, be, be very plain in our lives today. Lord, may we know that when the call comes, Lord, that we're ready to answer the call, no matter when it comes, no matter what we're doing, no matter how things may be laying out before us. But when the call comes, Lord Jesus, let us answer the call. Amen. Let us move forward in you. Let us do what you tell us to do. Let us lay aside all the worldly projects, all the worldly things, and follow after you, Lord God. Make your direction clear. And we'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor. For we ask this in Jesus' name. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen.